come to the water is our invitation through the summer. We are looking at uh, different passages of scripture that describe water and use it as symbol. We're looking at different stories, meeting different people that Jesus encountered by the water. So all summer we're talking about things that happen in and around and uh, symbols of the water. And this morning we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 14. If you'll want to start looking there, we're in Matthew chapter 14 as we consider the water walkway. Obviously thinking about the time that Jesus walked out on the water. As I prepared, I remembered a story about a a man that went to the Holy Land and he wanted to be out on the Sea of Galilee. So he wanted to rent a boat to go out onto the Sea of Galilee. And the man that that owned the boats that that was renting them out uh, said, well, it it costs $100 a day for you to have the boat to go out onto the Sea of Galilee. The man said, $100 a day? You've got to be kidding me. Where I come from, you could rent a boat for $25. The guy who rents out the boats said, well, sir, you have to understand, this is a special place. We rent the boats so that you can go out into the very water upon which Jesus himself walked. And the man said, well, if it cost $100 a day, no wonder he walked. (laughs) Obviously, Jesus walked for much more important reasons, and we're going to look into some of those together this morning. Look with me, Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to begin at verse 22. We're in Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to begin at verse 22. Had we time, we might walk through the entire chapter together. John the Baptist is put to death in the first section of the chapter. And then in the middle section of the chapter, Jesus feeds the 5,000. And we we always use that phrase, the 5,000. But the Gospels are clear to point out to us that it was 5,000 men And then you also have to add the women and children in that number. So he fed this great crowd with five loaves and two fish. Just an amazing miracle. And the disciples witnessed that very miracle. As a matter of fact, he he included them in the process. Uh, You may remember he went to the disciple, Andrew. What are we going to do? Andrew said, well, here's, okay, I'll take that from Andrew. Now, disciples, y'all go and split this up. Afterwards, disciples, you pick up, and there's all these baskets left over. He included them in the miracle. And so they should have learned an important lesson that our God through the Son, Jesus Christ, is more powerful than all the laws of nature. How he can take just a, a couple of, of fish and, and a few pieces of bread and he can feed the thousands and have leftovers. The disciples saw it. They lived it. They should have learned this great lesson that our God is a miracle working God. That he is bigger and stronger and over all the laws of nature. And once they had the opportunity to learn that lesson, it was testing time. You know, that's the way things work, isn't it? The, the teacher teaches us the lesson. And then to make sure that we learned the lesson, there's always that test. Well, we come to testing time in the last section of the chapter. We begin at verse 22, and we're going to read through it together, and then we'll back up and look at it more carefully. Immediately, now that ties it directly to the story that he's just told, right after he fed the 5,000 plus, while it's still in their minds, still on their hearts, They're still a part of the experience. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. 
They cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. As we look at the story again, we're, we can associate with those disciples in this boat with a storm all around them. And I want us to think about those storms that occur in life. The first thing that I want us to think about this morning is that storms test us. I wonder this morning, you don't have to raise your hand, but I wonder this morning if anybody is is in the midst of a storm today. You feel like you're a long way from shore and the, and the waves are just beating you from every side. And as the, as the verse said, the wind is against you. Chances are that there are some of us in the room that are in the midst of a storm. If you're not in the midst of a storm, it's because your storm just ended or it's because your storm is brewing. Our lives are full of storms. I want us to realize this morning that storms test us. The disciples had just experienced an, an, an amazing miracle of the power of God. Now, would they trust in that power when it became personal? Would they take that theory that they had seen acted out and would they depend on it when their lives counted on it? The test. So in verse 22, notice it said he made the disciples get into the boat. That brings up all kinds of questions. Why did he have to make them get in the boat? Oh, maybe it's been a very long day. He'd been teaching all day. That's why they had to go find food in the first place. Maybe they're just exhausted. They're saying, Jesus, man, let's, let's, just, let's just put up a tent here and, and, and sleep it off. Man, we're exhausted. Or, or maybe, maybe they can see the storm coming. And they're saying, Jesus, we don't want to get out there. We don't know why he had to make them, but Matthew is clear to, to use that, that verb. He, he forced them, made them, compelled them to get into that boat and go before him to the other side. And that brings up a very important issue that I want us to make sure that we're clear on. Often when a storm comes... We assume it's because we're out of the will of God. Or, more often, when a storm comes to someone else, we assume they are out of the will of God, which is why they're in the middle of a storm. Well, that might be true. That was true for Jonah. You remember Jonah was supposed to go yonder, and he said, I don't want to go yonder. So he got in a boat, and he went yonder. And God said, okay, I'm going to teach you. If I tell you to go yonder, you better best go yonder and not go your yonder. And so in order to teach him, he brought this great storm. And because of the storm, Jonah winds up in the water. And once he winds up in the water, he winds up in the belly of a fish. And then that fish spits him up where? Yonder. Right? So... There are times that God uses a storm to correct us. 
to say, hey, you're out of my will. But notice in this story, Jesus made these guys get in this boat. So the fact that they are in the boat, in the lake, during the storm, must mean that it was God's will. They were in God's will and still had to go through a storm. Please hear me. Because this is, a, this is a misunderstanding. And one of the reasons it's a misunderstanding is because so many people teach it incorrectly. The idea that if you follow Jesus and you trust in God, that life is going to be easy is a lie. It sounds good, so we like it. We love it. Yeah, if I believe Jesus... And, 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 and I trust in God, then my life will go easy. The reality is storms come even when you're in the will of God. You see, storms, some storms are used for correction, like Jonah. Some storms are used for perfection, like the disciples. They were about to embark on some amazing ministry that was absolutely important and key. A matter of fact, not long from here, Jesus is going to hand them the keys to the kingdom and he's going to say, now y'all go and make disciples and get her done. Well, I think he said get her done. Yeah. So in order to prepare them for what was coming, he had some perfecting to do in their lives. They had never yet really encountered this kind of test that would verify that, yes, they can take what they know to be true and they can apply it to their own lives. Jesus was perfecting them and preparing them. And sometimes he allows you and I to go through a storm because he's perfecting us, preparing us for bigger things next. And so in 22, he makes them get into the boat. And then in 23, after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And evening came. That means the sun was setting. Let's assume that's around 6 o'clock. I'll tell you why in a minute. But verse 24 but the boat by this time was a long way from land. Beaten by the waves, the wind was against it. This storm was brewing, and they were all, all the way out there in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, this grand lake. Well, how did this storm just kind of brew all of a sudden? Well, that's actually pretty common. The Sea of Galilee is 690 feet below sea level. And surrounding it are these plateaus, these hills. The Bible often calls them mountains, but if you've ever been to Colorado, you wouldn't call them mountains. They're, they're little hills and little plateaus. But, but as, the, as the, the wind comes off of the Mediterranean Sea, it wanders through these canyons and these hills, and as it does, it cools off. And so you've got this cool air coming in over water. And then on the other side, you've got this warm air coming in off the deserts. And when the cool air and the warm air meet each other over water, guess what happens? Boom! The, the storm is not rare occasion. It happens often, and so they knew there was always the chance, and they get into the boat, and they're out, and the sea, the storm hits. The storms test us. But notice as well with me very quickly that storms remind us of God's promises. Storms remind us of God's promise. When we go through a storm, one of the things they can do for us is to remind us of his promises promises. When Jesus told them to get into the, the boat in verse 22, he made them get into the boat and it says, and go before him to the other side. So he is saying, you and I are going to be together on the other side. That promise should have allowed them to get through that storm that night without fear. He said, we're going to be together on the other side. As you go through life storms, it often has the, has, has the 
uh, the, the ability to help remind us of God's promises. And the scriptures are full of God's promises. We want to make sure that we look at the promises that do apply to us. Not every promise applies to every person, but we want to make sure that we see the promises that apply to us and use those. One, just for example, we can find in Hebrews chapter 13, 5, where the author of Hebrews reminds disciples of Jesus that he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. There are times in life's storms where all we have to hold on to is God's promise that he will not leave us. You see, beloved, we live by promises. We don't live by explanations. You and I want explanations. Why, God? But that's not how he chose to allow us to live. That's not how we get through the storms. We get through with promises, not explanations. Third, I hope that you'll see with me this morning that even when we can't see Jesus, Jesus can see us. You remember he went up on the hillside, he sent the crowd away, he went up on the hillside to pray. While he's there, the sun begins to set and evening comes in. Most likely around six o'clock, he's up there on the hill, on that mountain, if you will. And they're out there in the boat in the lake. Now, when they're out there in the boat in the lake and it's starting to get dark around them, the storm is brewing, they look up and they can see the mountain, but they can't see Jesus. But while he's on that higher ground and there's very few boats out there, he can look and he can see them. Friends, I say that to just remind you that when we go through the storms, there are times when we can't see God. It's dark, it's scary, the waves are beating us and the wind is against us. God, where are you? Have you ever asked that question? If you've not asked it out loud, I'll bet that you have sensed it. God, where are you? Beloved, remember that when we can't see him, he can always see us. In the darkest times, it's most important that God see us than it is for us to see him. The psalmist even said that in Psalm 32 at verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Quoting God, God is speaking to his people. God says to us, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Jesus even referred to it earlier in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 10. He asked this question, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Two sparrows for a penny, they're not worth much. But a sparrow doesn't fall unless God sees it and knows all about it. He continues to say, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Now that's more important to some of you than some of us, but that's another issue. But listen, fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. If God pays attention to the sparrow, you are much more valuable than that. So um, you you can imagine that his eye is on you at all times when you can't see him because it's dark and the wind is beating and the, the waves are assailed. You know he can see you. Early in the spring of 1905, Sevilla Martin and her husband were traveling through Elmira, New York. They met there in Elmira, New York, the Doolittles. Mrs. Doolittle had been bedridden for almost 20 years. And Mr. Doolittle was disabled and stuck in a wheelchair. Yet they had this great faith and they lived happy lives that inspired everyone who knew them. Sevilla Martin's husband asked them how they could have such joy in their circumstance. Mrs. Doolittle answered, his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. That inspired Sevilla Martin so much that she sat down that night and wrote the poem that became 
the hymn, His Eyes on the Sparrow. That third verse of that beautiful hymn reads, Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to Him. From care He sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. We know that even when we can't see Jesus, Jesus can see us. And because sometimes we can't see Him, number four, I want to encourage you to learn to look for Jesus in the storm. Look for Him. In verse 25, we read that it was the fourth watch of the night. He came to them walking on the sea. The fourth watch of the night. The night is divided into four watches. From six to nine is the first watch. From nine to twelve is the second watch. From twelve to three a.m., is the third watch. This is the fourth watch, which means this is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Those hours in which no godly person should ever get out of bed. <laughs> of course, for me, it's another watch or two down, but that's another question. Listen, he He comes in the fourth watch of the night. He was on the hill as the sun was beginning to set. Now he comes to them somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m., which means they've been out battling this storm for eight, nine, might we say ten hours? They've been out there a long time time in that little boat in that massive storm and he comes walking to them on the water the thing that brings us the greatest trouble may be the very thing Jesus uses to show himself to us C.S. Lewis said God whispers to us in our pleasures speaks in our consciences but shouts in our pain It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Jesus came to them on the water. It might very well be that that those things that bring us the greatest trouble are the very things that Jesus uses to show himself to us. Remember, he walked on the water. So what scared them most was always under his feet. He is above anything that could bring us down. In Genesis, he created water. In Exodus, he parted water. In Mark, he slept on the water. In John, he changed water into wine. Then why are we surprised that in a storm, he can walk on the water? It was a long night. He showed up at 3, 4 in the morning. He may not come. Beloved, when we think he should. They were there a long time fighting that storm. He may not always come when we think he should, but he knows when we need him the most. He waited until the disciples were as far from land as possible so that all human hope was gone. He was testing the disciples' faith, and this meant removing every human prop You see, God shows up in the moment of our greatest desperation. He is the on-time God. You and I can't see that. We see, God, where are you? I need you now. And he says, no, you, you got a little bit more fight in you. I'll show up at just the right time to take care of you. When you know for certain that I'm your only way out. The bottom line is, they didn't recognize Jesus because they weren't looking for him. You remember in verse 26, they look up. In verse 26, the disciples saw him walking on the sea. They were terrified and said, it's a ghost. 
They didn't see Jesus. They they saw this apparition. Why? Because they weren't looking for Jesus. But I want to tell you that Jesus will show up at just the right time. And if you're going through a storm, you keep looking for him. Keep watching. He very well might be on his way to you. And you're not going to notice unless you're watching for him. Imagine if they had recognized him yards away from them. If they had recognized him way over yonder, they could have been at peace much earlier just knowing that he's on his way. The fifth thing that I want you to see this morning is that faith keeps us close to him. Even in the storm, faith keeps us close to him. You see in verse 27, immediately Jesus spoke to him and said, Take heart, it's me, it is I. Don't be afraid, it's not a ghost, it's me. Once they heard his voice, they recognized him. You see, there's no place that we can be where Christ can't find us. He is always on his way at just the right time his eye is always on us there's no storm we can go through no place we can be where he can't find us that night is never so black and our boat is never so frail that we're in danger beyond our father's care and so in verse 28 Peter answered and said Lord if it's you Command me to come to you on the water. Peter said, man, this is cool. I want to play. Put me in, coach. I want to get out there and do your thing. Peter is saying, I want to be with you. Not just because he wanted to do something spectacular, but because he wanted to be with his Jesus. He said, if it is you, meaning since it is you, let me be with you. For Peter, it was safer to be with Jesus on the water than without him in the boat. Which takes us to the next thing that we need to catch this morning, and that is that faith and fear don't get along. Faith and fear don't get along. Look at verse 30. But when he saw the wind, and you know you can't see wind, he saw the results. Of the wind. He's looking. Peter first saw Jesus. He said, Let me come to you. Jesus said, Come on, Pete. Peter got out of the boat. He started toward Jesus. But then, as he walked on the water, he looked at his circumstances. He looked at his surroundings. He looked at the effects of the wind as the waves were beating around and the, and, and the, the clouds were rolling. It says that he saw the wind. He was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Since fear and faith cannot coexist, faith disappeared and Peter went down. Max Lucado warns us, feed your fear and your faith will starve. When I first started Baylor, I stayed in the dorm. I stayed in Martin Hall and I don't know if it still does. Back then, Martin Hall had a basement that was, a, that was used for residential areas. And so I had a window in my room, but my window was ground level. So you look out, you see grass, you know. I lived in the basement. Well, when I first got started, I had a roommate, Charlie. Charlie and I didn't G-Hall. You know, you know that word? We weren't tight. Charlie liked the Eagles. That's fine. The old band, not the football team. Charlie came from Columbia. He had one Eagles tape. He played that tape over and over and over. That's all that dude did was play that tape. That's bad enough. But I, I had a collection of 
bicentennial quarters. You remember they made a special quarter in 1976? I, I collected them from 1976 until this year at the end of 83. I had 200 for the bicentennial. I had 200 quarters. I, I had them in a, little, in, in a little ceramic jar on my shelf. Over Christmas break, I went home. Since he was from Columbia, he had to stay there. I came back after Christmas break. Half my quarters are gone. I said, Charlie, that's my collection. Where are my quarters? He said, oh, I didn't know they were special. I used them for laundry. Charlie and I didn't get along. <laughs> Before too long, Charlie moved out of the room. He went somewhere else. I never listened to another Eagles song in my life. But you see, faith and fear make bad roommates. They don't get along. They cannot live in the same heart. So I'm telling you, if you let fear settle into your easy chair in your heart, what you're doing is kicking faith out. Look at the last part of verse 30 there. That wind came, he was afraid, beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. He knew what to pray when he was in over his head. Sometimes we don't have time for long, theological, beautiful, properly prepared prayers. Sometimes the most powerful prayer we can say is, God help. God help me. And that is that statement of faith that sends fear out and away. Beloved, before we criticize Peter for sinking, let's honor him for his magnificent demonstration of faith. He dared to be different. He got out of the boat. Anybody can sit in the boat and watch, but it takes a person of faith to leave the boat and walk on the water. Then he turned and let his fear take over, but he still demonstrated great faith. Matter of fact, I would rather be out in the water like Peter than in the boat like Thomas. See verse 31. Jesus immediately reached out his hand. Why? Because Peter said, help me. Jesus reached out his hand, took hold of him, and saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When he cried out, Jesus, help me. Jesus reached down and he lifted him up. I've been there. I've been there when all I knew to do is say, God, help. And every time at the right time, he shows up and he reached in and brought me up. When my life was at its worst, God was at his best. When the winds were against me, God was for me. When the clouds threatened harm, God gave me peace. When I was going down, God showed up. When there was no way out, God made a way through. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me. Now safe am I. Is that your testimony? Faith and fear don't get along. When we cry out in faith, he's there. Which takes us to the last thing I want you to notice and we're done. And that is that he will see you through. He will see you through. Verse 32, when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Why? Because the test was over. When he got in the boat, God, Jesus, brought Peter out of the water. They got back in the boat. The test was over. The wind ceased. Their faith had been tested. Our faith is strengthened by life's experiences, just like our muscles get strengthened when we push them to their limits. And so the disciples' 
faith was pushed to the limits. It was a storm intended for perfection, the test of preparation. And then notice the last verse. Those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Peter's experience turned out to be a blessing to the other disciples as well. When they saw the power of Jesus in conquering and calming the storm, all they could do was kneel down and worship him. You going through a storm? Remember, faith and fear don't get along. Double down on your faith so fear has to flee. Keep watching for Jesus because he's going to show up at just the right time. You're not going to know when that time is. You just keep trusting until he does. And then know that he's going to get you through. And when he does, you tell that story to others. Because they're going to kneel on their, they're going to get down on their knees and worship the Lord Jesus Christ because of what they've heard and seen him do through you. <laughs> 